Good afternoon, Grace Community family. Uh, excellent to be here with you doing Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Um, uh, this section starts with something that's really well known um, by many people, um, specifically a song from the birds um, in the 60s. Uh, that's typically what's really well known. And uh, we're going to take a look specifically at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 right after we get done with this loud noise in the corner. So that should go off in a second. Um, but you can still hear me somewhat. I know that. So I'm going to at least take a look at reading the text and you can follow along even if you can't hear me very well. Uh, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant a time to pluck up what's been planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. But what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in man's hearts, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that in whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is has already been, and that which has already been, I'm sorry, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of men, that God is testing them, that they might see that they themselves are but beasts. For whatever happens to the children of men, whatever happens to the beast is the same. One dies and so does the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place, all are from the dust, and to the dust all returns. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth? I saw that there is nothing better than that man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot, and who can bring him to see what will be after him? So, uh, sorry for the a little bit of an interruption on the noise there. That is our um, radon mitigation system. I usually try to shut it off beforehand, but I forgot. So, um, anyways, um, but so the section starts off, I think, particularly positive, almost sounding. Uh, everything there's a season, a time for every manner under heaven. That's a really positive statement. And then we we have this kind of poem. And um, if you don't like poetry, um, you probably don't like the Bible because the Bible is literally a ton of poetry. Um, and specifically, this poem is a wonderful poem about time and a time to do things and really everything that experiences under the sun. And it starts with the appearance of optimism uh, and it appears to give a poem in regarding to everything that we might experience in life. In fact, this poem is probably the most well-known passage in the Bible. Um, and so ultimately, this poem is breaking down into seven pairs uh, of the realities of life. It starts with a time to be born and a time to die. Uh, that life has an appointed time where it begins and an appointed time where it ends. And we have no sovereign control over it. And then from there, it, it goes down through all of these different kind of opposites and, and things. And um, the only one that's really kind of confusing is verse 5. Uh, most of us don't know what uh, cast away stones and time to gather stones together might mean. Um, and so um, what, what most scholars have argued that that's probably the destruction of cities and the building up of cities. Um, some have argued other things. Um, but the idea being that there are all of these things in life. And we don't necessarily know as humans what the right time is, which is what the 
Koheleth, the preacher, begins to declare afterwards. He says, we don't know when the right thing to do these things are. We know that there is a time for these things, but we don't know when they are. One commentator I was reading talks about how the human's experience is like the tapestry, and you may have heard this before, where we, we know that all of these things are to be done in their proper time, but as time is weaving itself together, all we see is, is the tapestry from the views of the strings behind. We don't see the beautiful picture that's being created on the other side by God. And so there's this element to which we don't know when these right things are, we just know that they exist. And that's what ultimately Quaheleth comes to, is he comes to verse 11. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And so it, these things are beautiful at the right time and in the right place. Now, that doesn't mean that you can argue from any one of these particular passages, the fact that like verse 8, in fact, many people in verse 8 will use a time for war and a time for peace. And they'll say, see, the Bible says there's a time for war, so this war is justified. And that's that would be saying that the Bible would say that there is a time for war, but not necessarily that your war is justified, just that there is a time for it. And now you need to evaluate with wisdom whether this time is a time for war or not. And so the, the reality is that God knows when the right time is, but man does not. He can't find it out, actually, is kind of the assertion. And so as he as he goes into verse 9, we get the immediate negative of Quaheleth, the preacher. And he says, what gain has a worker from his toil? We've already seen that before, and he's already talked about that. And he said, I've seen the business that God's given the children of man to be busy with. Uh, what is God? Well, he's gotten us busy to be with busy with all of those things that he's listed. And he says he's made everything beautiful in its time. And he's put eternity into man's hearts so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So what Kalos is saying is, is like everything's beautiful in its time, but we don't know what God's doing. We don't know how it works out. We don't know the right time. We don't we don't know the beginning from the end of any of this. And so we there's almost this there's almost this antagonism that ends up showing up. He's, in verse 12, he says, I perceive there's nothing better than for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. I also that everyone should eat and drink pleasure and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So basically just enjoy. This is kind of one of those carpe diem sayings of, of Ecclesiastes. Um, in, in a sense, he's already said that the, the toil and all of that is of no value and it's not meaningful. It's habel. And so verse 14 says, kind of continuing in this kind of vein, he says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it or taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which, ha that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. In the sense of that, the idea of all of the things in their proper place God has through his providence. And so we're not adding or subtracting anything to it. So to a sense, what's the purpose of any of it? Again, it, this leads the, the reader to a, a why. What, what's the purpose of man? What's the purpose of our life? If God has set eternity in our hearts, but all we know is is these small times and places, things, and we don't know when the right thing is to do it. We can't find anything out. There's almost this level of just like, well, fine, just, you know, do good and be joyful with the work that you have and take pleasure in toil because that's a gift that God gives us. And beyond that, we can know nothing. And this is ultimately what, we talked about a little bit last time that has become obsessed in the preacher's mind. Um, in verse 16, he begins thinking about the place of justice and that there's wickedness where righteousness should be. Uh, and that the, the judges of the earth and those who are appointed as judges and who are supposed to do right, they are wicked. And there's wickedness present there. And so he says in his heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. And God will know what that is, but we might not. And then verse 18, he says, I say in my heart with regard to the children of men that God is testing them. They may they see themselves are but beasts. He says, God must be testing us to help us realize we're, we're nothing. We don't know. We don't know anything about any of those things. We don't know anything about life. We don't know anything about the purpose. We don't know anything about what is right beyond what God has said. And he's just testing us to prove to us that we are just mere creatures, mere beasts, mere beasts of the field. And he, then he doubles down on that statement in verse 19. He says, whatever happens to the children of man, whatever happens to the beast, the same thing. We both die. And this is his obsession that we begin to see throughout the, the book of Ecclesiastes is that 
you know, the life is meaningless because we're going to die. And, and yet eternity has been set on our hearts. And yet there's this thing of death that's before us. He says they all have the same breath. We, we all die. Man has no advantage over the beast. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust. And to dust they all return. He makes this statement in verse 21. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes downward. Now, here's the reality of things. Without divine revelation, without God telling us the truth regarding those things, we, we couldn't know. We couldn't possibly know. There's no way to know. And so from, again, a earthly perspective, which is what Quahelth is doing, he's almost, he's almost denying the law of God exists, right? And, and he knows the law of God exists, but he's denying it for the purpose of his of his thought experiment. And in a sense, he's saying, look, based on only what we see and observe from the world around us, everything goes into the earth and there's, there's, no, there's no way out. It's dust to dust. So verse 22, he concludes, so I saw there's nothing better than that man should rejoice in his work for that is his lot. And which he's already concluded in the previous chapter is not sufficient to, bring, to provide meaning. At this point, he's concluding there probably is no meaning. That we can discern. Only God can discern it. And then he kind of tags us on at the very end. And I think it's very interesting. He says, who can bring him to see what will be after him? Who, who can do it? Only God can. And this is what the New Testament specializes in. Is that people have received visions of what will be afterwards. Christ, by his returning to life, has given us what it will be afterwards. These are the things that Quahelith longed to look into and to see and to understand. That were shadows and they were pictured in the Old Testament. They were prophesied of uh, and, and they were evident uh, there. But they were not as easily understood and, and, and visible as they are in the New Testament. And so uh, Quahelith is, is in, his, in his heart and in his mind, he's concluding there's no meaning, there's no certainty. We cannot know, we cannot control, and, and even death itself is not an end to the things that we can control. But as far as we know, that's all we have, unless somebody tells us otherwise. And I could tell you that someone has told us otherwise. And that, that eternity that God has set in our hearts and set in our minds is something that he has set there for a reason. He has a purpose behind it. And it's to cause him to seek after him. And when we seek after him, we will find him. And we will find that he's a rewarder of those who seek after him. And that in him is found not only life for now, but eternal life as well. So that's what we get from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, and uh, there's so much more that's said in there that we could go over, but uh, that's that's what we're going to focus on today. God bless you all. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Monday. And uh, in preparation for the storm tomorrow, I hope you're all doing well. We're going to hope to stream tomorrow and Wednesday, but we'll see how the weather treats us and whether or not I have power. So um, God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Monday. Take care.